Christmas. Oh, f that. Hello, I'm Charlie Brooker, and you're watching the Screen Wipe Christmas Special. Christmas is the most magical time of the year. More magical even than four bank holidays glued together and multiplied by Easter. It's a time of peace on earth and goodwill to all men except him. But more importantly, it's a time for your TV to cough a feast of entertainment all over your living room carpet. <laughs> Holiday programmes for Tuesday on BBC One. Yes, TV pulls out all the stops at Christmas, leading to a curious but genuine sense of excitement and occasion. You'd have to be a Cyberman not to feel a slight tingle in the loins at the first sight of the double-decker Christmas Radio Times, or the unveiling of the BBC Christmas Ident, which in recent years has been a slick mini-movie with a festive theme. But used to be an altogether more charming, albeit slightly creaky affair, made with love by the BBC Props Department. As the 25th of December draws nearer, the TV schedule starts filling up with special festive editions of popular shows. These are often the same as a regular episode, apart from having some snow on the logo and a bit of holly round the sides. No, I don't, I don't like this either. Merry Christmas. Of course, another surefire indicator that Christmas is on the way is the increased proliferation of adverts for gifts, some of them the stuff of nightmares. Hey, Furby, sing me a song. Now I said sing me a song, not squawk like a c For one or two cretins, Christmas only officially begins at the first appearance of the cockle-warming Coca-Cola Christmas ad, in which a traditional kindly Santa pushes Coke to kids. Of course, in this day and age, it seems quite brave of them to stick with an old man who hangs around with children. I keep expecting an angry mob to turn up and beat him to death with misspelled placards. Yes, today it's hard to shake the suspicion that there's something vaguely sinister about Santa, which is presumably why Debenhams have felt the need to modernise him like this. Hey Santa. <laughs> Santa baby. Although unfortunately in the process they've turned him into a massive ballet. Hope you drive your sleigh up your own arse, you Christmas tit. The Yuletide magic truly reaches a peak on Christmas Day itself. <laughs> The day starts early when the nation's kids wake up, wipe the sleepy dust from their eyes and set about tearing their presents open with selfish, grasping hands, only to wind up feeling sort of dead and empty inside because their presents are rubbish. On Christmas morning, the TV tends to be largely ignored in the background while the family potters around being awkwardly jovial. All right, you f***ers, yeah? Merry Christmas. As a result, the morning schedule tends to just guff out a treat to keep the kids quiet. Mm. That, or since it's the one time a year they can get away with it, they'll put on something that no one in their right mind would possibly watch if they weren't stranded at home with the relatives. Something like this. Noel Edmonds was a Christmas TV fixture for over 14 years, i.e. 15 years, starting with the almost unbearably exciting Live Live Christmas breakfast shows, broadcast from the top of a gigantic glass and concrete penis slap bang in the middle of London. These shows were basically extended technical marvels in which Noel used every broadcasting gizmo he could get his hands on, showing a kind of giggly disregard for whether it was going to be interesting to do so or not. That's why we were treated to countless live link-ups with the Hollycopter as it soared above London, relaying the sort of images that look unsettlingly like a low-budget British 911 set at Christmas. Can we have a bit more waving there? It's very difficult to see. I can't hear you on the phone, Noel, but I can hear you on the, on the television. The BBC's motto used to be, Nation shall speak unto nation, and Noel made those words a thrilling reality, thanks to lots of satellite link-ups between relatives on other sides of the globe. And this is the sound of my daughter, Noel, and you know Ron, don't you? Of course, the problem with relying on state-of-the-art technology is that it often goes wrong, adding a fairly fractious air to what's supposed to be a sort of feel-good, festive fun fest. I think this is a fault at our end, rather than a fault with the actual phone that he's holding. I'm getting nothing on this now. What was that? Uh, can we get the Australian picture? Noel was aided and abetted by his trusty sidekick, Mike Smitty Smith, seen here bringing his unique brand of bland effervescence to Charing Cross Hospital. Whoa! A white Christmas! Good work, Mike. Really bloody Christmassy. This is absolute fucking gold. Oh, she's bloody... Oh, block her, Smitty. There's a laugh. Oh, that's the way. The dizzying combination of Noel, Smitty, a helicopter, an ugly corporate tower and of course a national holiday celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ obviously attracted a whole host of top-notch celebrity guests. Guests such as, um, uh, oh, Michael Fish and live via satellite, Rula Lenska and Dennis Waterman who's turned up without a shirt. 
Is well, the BBC Club open? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, nothing's really open here at the moment. Actually, possibly the most excruciating celebrity appearance of all time occurred on one of these shows when Howard Jones turned up live at the Charing Cross Hospital to plug his latest single. <laughs> Here we see a woman in the background who looks like she doesn't want to get to know Howard well. In 1991, it was out with Telecom Tower and in with the new show, Noel's Christmas Presents, which consisted of Noel springing feel-good surprises on members of the public who'd had a pretty hard time of it recently. Like Jeremy Beadle, he'd often pop out when people were least expecting it, often leaving them looking so bewildered they'd probably get down on their knees and suck him off if he asked. He then delivered specially tailored gifts, which often escalated in niceness as they went along, reaching insane levels of goo goo. Silence. Oh. Here, for example, we see a woman who's been in and out of hospital being serenaded by a choir boy. But that's not enough, so let's add a whole choir. And a marching band, and a sort of funk jazz fusion act, and a gospel choir. And last but for fuck's sake, nowhere near least. Michael of God. The show's unstated aim seems to have been to overwhelm the recipients until they start blubbing uncontrollably, and it certainly worked here. Well, unless she's crying because Michael Ball's just blown off or something. This bloke isn't crying, but he does have a wistful chunk of snot hanging out of his nose. Anyway, for my money, the best bits of the show are actually in between the presents themselves. I'm talking about Noel's links. Some of these were ridiculously sumptuous and seem to have been shot in the middle of the Quality Street tin. A very happy Christmas morning to you. At their best, these links are solid gold Alan Partridge. On the 11th day of Christmas, my true love said to me, You're Alan Piper's piping. Oh, you're Alan Piper's piping. Oh, you're Alan Piper's piping. And when I made a surprise visit to a marvellous school in Devon, there were 11 scholars startled. Anyway, it's easy to be all modern and superior and snort at Noel and his silly jumpers like I've just done for the last few minutes. But I can't help thinking it's just plain nicer than the sort of thing you get today. After all, now you're more likely to switch on the TV on the 25th of December and see some sneering arsehole pouncing on strangers and rubbing shit in their faces. Then going, yee, Merry Christmas, actually in a show called, yee, Merry Christmas. Like that in quotes, Merry Christmas, anyone who likes Christmas is a c Because that's what our modern world has become, ladies and gentlemen. For this Christmas special, I asked internet animator David Firth of FatPie.com to come up with a festive animation for us. Unfortunately, what he came up with was so offensive, I can only show you a few seconds, like this. Saws are too hard to use, be easier to use. But luckily, he then turned it over to his fictional colleague, the very professional Jerry Jackson, who animated this replacement for us. My name is Jerry Jackson, and this is a Christmas cartoon. For Christmas dinner, we had fish and chips, and it tasted horrible, because my mum is crap at cooking. Here is your dinner, Jerry. Well, it looks like shit, mum. I know. For my Christmas, I got our Xbox 400 and a million games. What did you get, John? I got our toothpaste and toilet duck for the bathroom. Because it needs cleaning and my mum says I have to clean it, but I don't want to. I want to play a computer games with Jerry Jackson. No, John, I've only got one pad and I'm not sharing because you're gay. I like the Marks and Spencers adverts. They show food right close up and it looks right nice. Mum, can you get us some of that this Christmas? No, Jerry, we are skint, so we aren't getting our Christmas food from the car boot sale. My mum got 110 lollies for £1.5 from the car boot sale. They were Jamaican and they were expired, but it was right nice. Later that day we threw our dinner at mum because she can't cook. I have tried my best to make this fish and chips for dinner and you have thrown it in my face, literally. Mum, that is a rare posh word. Are you some kind of boffin scientist or something? You should be doing experiments. I don't think my mum could do experiments because she can't cook. That was my cartoon for Charlie Booker. Thank you for watching. I, I got paid a million pounds for it. The TV comes back into its own following Christmas dinner. Lolling about, stuffed so full of carbohydrates you can scarcely blink, the best course of action is to just lie back and soak up whatever's on the box. TV has you captive and is about to score some of its highest ratings of the year. First, though, there's the Queen's Speech, which every year simultaneously bores literally...
if you think that's depressing it's not a patch on another big traditional Christmas afternoon watch Christmas in EastEnders is traditionally the single most dispiriting broadcast of the year an alternative gloomy verse in which even the simplest bit of festive cheer is only allowed to exist for a few seconds before misery knocks on the door it's not as if they don't try to be cheerful. I mean, the residents of Albert Square do enjoy all the usual Yule-type things, like the feel-good bonhomie of a traditional Christmas dinner. The heartwarming exchange of carefully selected gifts. This, my sweet, is a letter from my solicitor. Sincerely spreading goodwill to all the neighbours. Happy Christmas. And to you. And, of course, letting their hair down with a good old-fashioned rollicking Yuletide sing-song. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Throughout the square's history, the Mitchell brothers have been at the epicentre of most of the dreadful moments, a bit like the ghosts of Christmas shit. There's Grant, who always vaguely resembles a testicle bobbing in a bathtub, and Phil, who's a sort of dark, misanthropic anti-Santa. You can always rely on them to prance around the square like jolly little helpers, handing out jocular yuletide banter. If you look into the black mass, the next one's at six o'clock up on the allotments. This isn't funny. And heartfelt declarations of love. You make me sick. He was physically turning into Nookie Bear there. The biggest Christmas dinner always takes place at the Vic, which isn't exactly a gastronomical Eden. Not that it matters, no one gets to ingest so much as a sprout. They're too busy skillfully arranging a year's worth of arguments into one sustained symphony of bellowing, like they're the National Orchestra of Shoutland or something. I need a top hat. I told you. Mum, it's right, I can handle this. I don't believe this. That's my grandchild you're carrying. Mum. Oh, don't you start. Oh, no, no. Do you mind? That's my wife you're talking to. Are you satisfied? Well, well done. You shouldn't have been so idiotic. Oh, rubbish. Just down the law. Actually, That's I don't all. know what I'm doing yeah. here. And I don't need any advice from you either. Mum, make them stop. Oh, well, it's time for the big injection. Look, why don't you shut it? Phil, you're out of order. Oh, well, I've touched the nerve, have I? Shut up! With so many Christmas vendettas running at once, it's hard to keep track, and one year, Peggy actually started a fight with her own reflection. <laughs> Look, she's worked it out. One of the most harrowing Christmas incidents occurred in the year 2000 when Phil Mitchell seduced TV's Tamsin Outhwaite. Oh, God, this is like specialist Amsterdam warthog pool. <laughs> they didn't even spare us the pleasure of witnessing the couple's postcoital joy in all its cuddlesome glory. We wanted it, so we did it. I didn't. Really? You could have fooled me. Phil. What has got into you? We all know what got into you about a gallon of balding mechanics spunk. Yeah, and you loved it, didn't you? Still, it's not all doom and gloom. There was one tender moment in 2003 when Sonia appeared to grant Jamie one final Christmas wish by sucking him off on his deathbed. <laughs> Bet your tenor is thinking of someone else. Anyway, EastEnders isn't just torturing characters in the name of festive ratings. No, it's confronting important issues. Hi. Take Little Mo's appalling treatment at the hands of a satanic overlord called Trevor, which, for reasons beyond the realm of normal human understanding, was recently voted one of the British public's favourite Christmas TV moments. It's the kind of horror that could only be interpreted by one of the sharpest minds in the country. When it comes, it, it's such tragedy because it's heading Christmas dinner, so it's, it's the wickedest thing he could do. Oh, I don't know, Tina. It looks like he put the effort into the roast potatoes. Hey, you're not hungry. This wasn't just a cheap holiday in other people's misery. It was opening all our eyes, yeah? It was pretty grim Christmas telly viewing, but at the same time, there's a lot of that going on in Britain, and it was an important message to get across. If you've got to do negative issues, what about diarrhoea? I mean, there's a lot of that around on Christmas Day, and there's never been a special in which Ian suddenly shits himself in the middle of a game of Pass the Parcel, unless that's coming up this year. <laughs>
Over the years, I'd heard talk of mysterious informal tapes, codenamed Christmas tapes, circulated amongst TV insiders. It was said these tapes contained material so shocking it could never be shown to the public. I wanted to find out more. A contact agreed to meet me on the understanding we hired an actor to play him and altered his voice in post. Hello? All right? Yeah. Oh, great, thanks for asking. No problem. So, uh, you're going to ask me about these tapes then? Yeah, sorry. Um, what exactly are... Christmas tapes, right, was an unofficial festive treat what got sort of circulated at the end of the year amongst the backroom boys who worked in VT. Well, we seem to have temporarily lost that programme, but meanwhile we continue with White Powder Christmas. And at 8pm, The Good Life, showing that self-sufficiency is possible anywhere outside the BBC. Starting out something the BBC VT department did. A lot of them had to work Christmas Day, playing in all the pre-recorded shows, so, you know, they needed a bit of cheering up. Later ITV started doing their own tapes, each of the regions, right, would make one, then there'd be a little contest to decide whose was best. It started out as outtakes, really. Every time something went wrong in the studio, people knew it would end up on the tapes. Of course, these were the days before we saw people making mistakes on TV, so they were a funny novelty then. Today you see some of the ruder ones on shocking shows like TV's Naughtiest Blunders. How long can I? Insufficient data. Yeah, you never fucking know the answer when it's important. As time went on, right, tapes got a bit more complex. You'd get little sketches made specially for them, links with, like, well-known faces and shit. Oh, <laughs> Mr Randall! <laughs> He's a couple of very nice crackers there. <laughs> there were lots of technical TV in-jokes as well. I mean, a lot of it wouldn't make sense to anyone who didn't work in VT in the late 70s to the mid-80s. We're still getting these changeable decisions from the presentation department. A good deal of wind, too. But I do have a couple of cold fronts to show you. They're quite raunchy in places, aren't they? Well, in places, yeah. You have to understand this was a very blokey world, right, in a very different time. Did these Christmas tapes ever leak out? Yeah, bits of them did. Some tabloid did an expose once. Then there was this naughty rainbow sketch that made it onto TV. Lots of sort of cheap innuendo performed with straight faces and that. We could hear you all banging away. Banging can be fun. Yes, and I was banging away all last night with Rod and Roger. So that was originally written and performed by the cast specifically for a Christmas tape? Yeah, but then Victor Lewis Smith... Who? Victor Lewis Smith. He's sort of like a rich man's you. Right. He put the rainbow sketch in one of his excellent TV awful shows on Channel 4 a few years back, and it sort of permeated into popular folklore as a result. Never saw it. What, never? Nope. You'd have liked it. Can we move on? Now it just remains for me to say a very Merry Christmas to all the boys in VT. So what became of the Christmas tapes? Are they still around today? No, they died out, didn't they? I mean, you've got your TV's naughty's blunders and your aunt is bloomers now, so there'd be less novelty. And you'd email clips to each other anyway, or stick them up on YouTube. End of an era, then? Yup. Yeah, Merry Christmas, yeah. <laughs> now here's comedian Rhys Thomas talking about a programme he remembers from his childhood, which I think took place about five minutes ago. The Box of Delights was one of those programmes which um, the BBC made for children that ran up to Christmas. It's set in the 1940s and it's about a boy who uh, comes home from school and then obviously, like all those things, comes back for Christmas and gets involved in, in an adventure and an old man sees him on the train and basically he's a magic man and uh, he's got a Box of Delights that he gives to him, the boy, to protect because there's bad people after him and the box. And I may bring more than my show. In my box are such delights as you. Inside the box, you can go back in time, uh, you can go small, big, or whatever, and there's a bad man called Abner, who's the evil man, who's, he's kind of like a Nazi, even though he isn't, played by Robert Stevens. He's after the box and the boy. Where is the box now? For well, there was no sign of it when we captured him at Arthur's <laughs> camp this morning. Because he's a, a, a you know, a true thespian, and very theatrical, he put so much into the performance that he is frightening because you really believe that he's real. He doesn't camp it up and, and make it funny. He's just really scary. I will get that box from him, Rat. For it will give me power. But my favourite character in The Box of Lights is Cole Hawley, who's the old Punch and Judy man, played by Patrick Troughton. You know, these days, in this world of uh, everyone, you see an old man and he's, he's talking to a little boy, you think the wrong thing. There's something about him and how warm he is and lovely. It makes you just want to cuddle him, do you know what I mean? It make, it make me, there's something with me. I look to you. Will you keep it and see that they never get it? The visual effects in the Box of Delights, I mean, 
compared to the day standards, obviously, are, aren't very good. But, you know, what still does look good are the shrinking scenes. It's scenes where um, the baddies are coming and they've got a toy boat on the river and uh, he uses the box of delights and they shrink and they use and they get on the toy boat and they float down the stream. The animation is what is, is, is the best part of it. There's a scene where Kay Harker goes into the box and goes into a wood and meets this hunter and he, beca and he starts off running like a, like a deer. What everyone will remember is the title sequence where you see all the characters' faces. There's a wolf's head and there was, then you see the, the uh, Abner's face and then you see like a rat thing. And it's quite creepy. The best, best bit is when Cole Hawkins goes into the picture and disappears uh, on a donkey. That's nice. I suppose you could say he's a little bit like Jesus. But Jesus wasn't on the... Was he on a donkey? No, it was just Mary and... Mary, was, Mary and Joseph were on the donkey. Jesus wasn't born then, no, he wasn't born. I really honestly think that there's nothing on television like this anymore. I mean, I don't see it. Now, those were the days when it did snow at Christmas and it was really cold. I sound like an old man, but I, I'm, they, they were the best years of my life and even thinking about it makes me sad, to be honest. By the time Christmas evening trundles round, chances are you've completely run out of things to say to each other or you've got so drunk you couldn't think your way out of a wet paper bag. With all this heating and all these bodies, the room soon becomes so oppressively warm, any kind of motion whatsoever is completely unthinkable. You're trapped here together. This is just what it would be like sharing a shelter together after a nuclear holocaust, except at least then half the c**ts would be lying dead outside in a bin liner with their national insurance number tipexed up the side, not taking up too much room on the sofa and silently blowing off every five minutes. F me, have you been eating burnt grass or something? It smells like someone's opened a f Tomb. What have you got in there? Dogs' bowels? Jesus Christ! At this point, telly comes into its own as a kind of magic escape portal, a set of shimmering blinkers that make everything else disappear. Here's where the channels wheel out their biggest Christmas hits. It's all good-natured, nation-uniting, slap-happy, gang-show fun. This tradition started back in 1958 with Christmas Night with the Stars, an annual Yuletide goodie bag which mixed cheerful musical numbers with special five to ten minute fun size festive editions of popular comedies. Everything from the cosy God, don't they look young there sitcom marriage lines. I've always wanted to buy you something to wear, but I've never been sure of your size before. <laughs> to the glam rock surrealism of the goodies. <laughs> Although, let's face it, in this state, you'd watch absolutely anything. What's that? A, a load of snowy, horse-drawn bullshit? Yes, please. Since almost everyone in the country winds up slumped in front of the box on Christmas evening, most of the big specials have become engraved on the national conscience, by which I mean we remember them. Many deserve to be remembered. They were crafted with love, a real sense of, hey, let's muck in and entertain the nation. Good old-fashioned crowd-pleasing. That's what should be on at Christmas, and by and large, that's what is. Mind you, the definition of crowd-pleasing has changed somewhat throughout the years. For years, this cheerful, quipping magician was one of the nation's biggest draws, whereas today it's de rigueur to sneer at him, and I don't really understand why. I mean, he was my childhood hero. That man entertained millions of people at Christmas. What have you done that's so bloody superior to that? And his theme song had the best lyrics ever. Mind you, a lot of things are a bit less popular than they used to be. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Black and White Minstrel Show! Once upon a time, the Black and White Minstrel Show was considered acceptable Christmas Day fair. Today, it's downright mind-boggling. Not to mention offensive on about 17 billion different levels at once. Especially if you stop gasping long enough to actually listen to the lyrics. We want a snake for Christmas, yeah, yeah. All slippery and sliding and red. <laughs> Of course, we all love a bit of music at Christmas. That's why everyone on the box insists on pointlessly bursting into song at the first sign of tinsel. Santa Claus is my name, and a Christmas wrapping is the game. Here we see John Leslie gamely zhuzhing up a festive Blue Peter like the musical natural no one wants him to be. Christmas wrapping. Good job there's two P's in wrapping. Christmas wrapping. Oh, come on, come on, come on. 
You could be forgiven for thinking that come Christmas time, any old show will just chuck in a musical number for the sake of it. Apart from this show, obviously. Hark the herald angels sing F***ing glory to the newborn bloody king Yeah! Peace on earth and mercy mild F***ing God and sinner reconciled well, you know what? Ours might be a cynical, detached, cold, even unfeeling sort of a programme, but nevertheless, we're no exception to the festive singing and dancing rule, which is why right now, to see us out, we've got the Actionettes with some lovely dancing, while I go over there and build a snowman or look at a robin or something. Merry Christmas, and I genuinely mean that. <laughs> Prepare for a scare tomorrow night on BBC Four Ghost Stories for Christmas from 10. Oh,